Easton comes to IES from Chicago, where most recently he was executive director of the Consortium on Chicago School Research at the University of Chicago. Easton was affiliated with the consortium since its inception in 1990 and became its deputy director in 1997. John also served a term between 2003 and 2007 on the National Assessment Governing Board, which sets policies for the National Assessment of Education Progress, the NAEP, the nation's report card. John holds a PhD in measurement, evaluation, and statistical analysis from the University of Chicago, a master's degree from Western Washington University, and a bachelor's degree from Hobart College. He's the author or co-author of numerous reports and articles and two books, charting Chicago school reform, democratic localism as a lever for change in organizing schools for improvement, lessons from Chicago, both published by the University of Chicago Press. We're delighted uh, this morning to, to welcome John Easton. Uh, I will say that I've had the great opportunity over the course of the last year to have a couple meetings with John, and I found him to be uh, an extraordinarily thoughtful and uh, insightful person about the role that uh, education research can play in the making of policy and the changing of uh, outcomes for kids and families. So thanks very much, John, for being here. Welcome. Thanks very much, Bob. I really uh, appreciate that nice introduction. Uh, it made me think of something. You mentioned those books. Well, one of those books is 10 years old. And uh, yesterday, I got a $4 royalty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm really uh, pleased to be here with you today. Uh, uh, as you may know, IES supports a lot of promising research projects on a doctoral program here at the Curry School. And uh, among the um, many duties that I have and opportunities at IES, uh, the opportunity to talk to young researchers is really among my very favorite. And I really like to talk about the importance of our work and really spur people on to continue and ramp up this kind of work. It can make a big difference in kids' lives and improving schools. Uh, here, you have the National Center for Research on Early Childhood Education, which is informing a lot of critical policy questions in this high-profile field. And as I looked into it and read some of your work, I just, all it did was make me want to know more about this. It was so fascinating. And my thanks to Bob for leading the work with colleagues here and elsewhere. And we know that uh, improving the quality of early childhood education really requires a sustained focus on learning more about how to strengthen the quality of adult and child interactions. And I think your research around professional development for preschool and head start teachers really reflects that. The leadership symposia that accompany the center provide a great forum for sharing knowledge and best practices among early childhood researchers and practitioners. And I do want to really uh, single out and applaud you for making a real effort to be accessible, to make this research uh, reach out to people in an easy kind of way. These are in focus reports. They're two-page summaries that really do a beautiful job of explaining important, complex uh, research for educators and really kind of succinctly um, highlight the implications for practice. I read a couple of them and learned all sorts of things that I didn't know, and which led me to wish I did know more about that. So uh, we're, we're also proud at IES to support both pre-doctoral and post-doctoral programs here that offer fellows an opportunity to strengthen their skills in rigorous research, and but allowing them to work on multidisciplinary projects on a range of policy relevant issues. Now, of course, there's also lots else going on at this university sponsored by IES. People exploring <coughs> adolescent engagement, social competence, uh, the connection between teachers' instructional practices and value-added scores, and teacher attrition. Um, but I highlighted the work of increase and the pre- and postdoctoral programs because they dovetail with two key goals that I have uh, and that I want to talk about today. And that's training a new generation of researchers 
and building mutually beneficial partnerships between these researchers and school leaders and policymakers that can engender relevant, useful research. Uh, the good news is that IES, I think we're making some real headway in this direction, especially on the partnership front. And some of that is reflected in some of our really major projects. Uh, one of which is our work to evaluate the federal stimulus funds for education. Another is a $100 million research network so for, solely focused on reading comprehension. Uh, but most of the progress is taking uh, shape in small ways, uh, new grant programs, uh, changing deadlines for, for uh, grant applications so that they can respond to policy changes, new languages in our RFAs that really encourage partnerships among researchers, practitioners, and policymakers. And we're engaging practitioners more in our own set work inside the agency and striving to be have more publications like this that are really uh, accessible to a broad group of stakeholders. And these are kind of small but everyday decisions uh, made by a staff that's committed to making our work useful uh, for school improvement to make schools better across the nation. So uh, Michael Fullen has a little book about school and district change, uh, which he, where he calls successful change as a, a small set of common principles and practices that are relentlessly pursued. Uh, so in the same vein that IES first generation of IES relentlessly pursued rigor in its work and rigorous methods, uh, we're going to pursue relevance without backing off on rigor, but the same commitment toward moving forward. So Bob mentioned I spent uh, my whole career of working either for or with a big urban school district. So I get some uh, background and understanding about uh, the need for patience in working with these giant bureaucracies. So I think uh, kind of a parallel of new principals uh, who come into a new school. Uh, some of them are full of big ideas and visions. Uh, some take one approach and sort of turn things upside down the first couple of months. Uh, we see a lot of this kind of ill effect of turnover, tossing out curriculum, revamping staff, overhauling policies, restructuring schedules. But there's a different approach that I identify more strongly with. That's trying to observe and see what's going on, what's working, what's not, tapping into the expertise of the staff that's there, talking to students about their experiences. I think this is the way to make change, to sort of chip away at the challenges and zero in on the key changes that are meaningful and sustainable. So I've got, I've got five years, not quite five, 4.7 or something <laughs> like that to go. And I really uh, am committed to keeping at this theme of greater relevance and greater usability from our work. But I want it to be, uh, uh, to take deep root in IES. And I want it to be sustainable so that it can outlive my tenure and really have an influence on the next generation of education researchers. So I want to spend a little time talking about how we are relentlessly pursuing this small set of common principles and practices. So the, con my conviction that researchers can make a difference in schools uh, was shaped by uh, this long experience in Chicago. I spent my whole career analyzing data researching reform and school improvement efforts, and working very closely with members of Chicago's education community to make these findings useful. And as Bob said, I worked at a university-based uh, research group at the University of Chicago uh, that was really committed to the a new model of research with a level of school engagement that you rarely find among traditional researchers who sit inside academic departments. So these are researchers who are not content with just publishing reports and 
disseminating findings. But they really actively help district leaders, principals, teachers, and the broader civic community understand how to use the research to improve their schools. Often we hear researchers who will do a study on some uh, topic that they're really interested in, uh, present findings to leaders or schools and say, well, here's something good for you to use. And if it isn't picked up, and if it isn't used, the researchers are kind of perplexed. Well, why, why, didn't, why did they disregard this great advice of ours? Um, but that's not how it works. For, for practitioners and policymakers to want to use our research findings, we really have to engage them in the research process. We have to develop these kind of partnerships. Um, by inviting practitioners and policy makers to the table from the very beginning to make sure that we're studying the right problems of practice and policy. Uh, so I, I think when researchers are really tuned into these voices of practitioners and policy makers throughout the entire research cycle, that, that's from planning and designing to interpreting findings to working through the implications for policy and practice. Then the policymakers and practitioners have, have, some, uh, have some investment in this, and they're much more willing to take up the findings when they've had a role in the planning, the design, and the conduct of the, of the studies. So we often hear the phrase, uh, from research to practice. So what I'm suggesting is that we really also need to think about from practice to research just as much. So this kind of commitment uh, supported top-notch, rigorous education research that matters to schools and improves educational outcomes for children. Uh, that's what will drive our work at the Institute of Education Sciences over the next five years. Uh, you'll see this commitment reflected in our new research priorities, uh, which were posted for public comment this summer. Uh, my board, the National Board of Education Sciences, has had one discussion about these, and uh, they will come up for approval at the next board meeting. Uh, the, the document is very short, just a couple pages long, but it acts as a mission statement for the agency that will guide the kind of work we fund, the methods we use, the questions we expect our work to answer, and ultimately the audience that we want to reach with our findings. Among many others, your Dean Bob uh, helped to uh, think about and shape these research priorities. Well, the ink isn't dry yet, but we have just uh, announced a major initiative that will help bring some of these priorities to fruition. Uh, the new Reading for Understanding Research Network is a $100 million commitment on our IES's part. That's the single largest uh, amount of money we've committed to a single research topic. It's going to bring together 130 researchers across the country working in partnership with teachers and school leaders to tackle this real critical need. How to improve reading comprehension for all students from preschool to high school. There are six different teams that represent a wide range of disciplinary specialties that include linguistics, cognitive psychology, developmental psychology, reading, speech, language pathology, assessment, and evaluation. They will work together to rapidly develop instructional strategies, technology, curricula, teacher professional development, and assessments to enable all students to read with understanding. So I don't really need to tell you why this is so important. Uh, across the country, we've invested billions of dollars uh, teaching children to read and learning how to do it better. But many students still don't understand what it is that they are reading to succeed well <coughs> enough in college, school, or the, or the workplace. Some of our own data from NAEP really demonstrate this, this challenge. One out of three fourth graders and one out of four eighth and twelfth graders can't, cannot read at the basic level of me. 
So teachers have a real great stake in solving this problem, and that's why they're going to be sitting at the table during this five-year project. From the beginning, as collaborators and not as study subjects, teachers and district leaders will contribute to the design and development of interventions to ensure that they're feasible and practical for implementation within existing school structures. Each of the winning applications has a strong history of school research partnership, and each clearly specified how their school partners will participate in the overall project. Now here's one example of how it will work for one team. They're bringing together reading specialists based both in the schools and the universities, along with middle and high school teachers. Uh, the teachers will be engaged as co-researchers in ongoing professional communities as the team designs, implements, and refines curriculum units. Teachers will weigh in as the curriculum takes shape in the classroom, offering valuable feedback on implementation challenges and student engagement. Uh, I can't tell you how proud I am to have been at IES to see such a big project be launched in my first year. Uh, another project that I think really signals a change at IES is a major new initiative within our National Center for Education Evaluation and Regional Assistance, and that's evaluating the impact of the federal stimulus funds for education. In addition to one larger study of changes in states and districts that are engendered by these funds, we'll be conducting impact studies of school <coughs> turnarounds in Race to the Top and through school improvement grants. And in addition, impact studies of the teacher incentive fund programs. So we're really pushing IES to become a key player in learning more about school improvement and change processes and communicating our findings in a compelling fashion to those folks who need to hear us the most. <coughs> we can't squander this incredible opportunity of all these big changes going on. Uh, without really learning from them and learning more about the school improvement process. process. Uh, we're going to be providing ongoing formative feedback internally to our colleagues in the education department and regularly communicate with state leaders. We planned a whole range of multiple types of reports that will look at implementation and outcomes both at the state and district level and it's our goal to turn these reports around more quickly than we have in the past so that we can help the department and states take mid-course corrections as needed. So how else are we inspiring these kinds of partnerships at IES and more broadly at the federal level? Now some of it's happening across, all across the Department of Education. You can see it in the state district research partnerships proposed in Race to the Top, you can see it in the I-3 grants that offer money to districts to partner with outside researchers. Uh, you could see it also at IES as we provide technical assistance <coughs> to these external researchers so that we can aggregate their findings and generalize across multiple evaluation studies as part of our larger era evaluation. We're also building languages language into our uh, request for applications that explicitly encourage, and in a few cases actually require, collaboration between researchers and schools. So you may know that we sponsor 10 regional, lab, lab, regional education laboratories across the country, and their contracts are about to come up. So we're really thinking hard about how we can redirect more profitably the work of these labs. And the 10 labs are our closest link to state and district agencies. So we need to find a way to enrich the work they do around providing technical assistance and facilitating research and evaluation activities to best serve the needs of educators in the area. <coughs> Uh, going forward, as we shape new grant programs that will reflect our new priorities, we're going to expect our funded researchers and our evaluation contractors 
to really dig deeper, more deeply into the educational and learning processes and the mechanisms through which schooling policies and practices affect students. This is sort of more of that digging into that black box that Sarah mentioned to me earlier. So it's, it's going beyond the what works and what doesn't work into questions of how, why, for whom, and under what conditions. And this is going to require us supporting more research on the effects of practices and programs on different subgroups of students, testing hypotheses around mediating processes and mechanisms, and studying uh, more closely the role of classroom, school, and social context in moderating the effects of policies and practices. Now, last spring, we announced a new grant program that attempts to dig deeper into the organization and management of schools and districts. Researchers who apply will study the organizational factors, such as the coherence of the instructional program, the degree of trust among the adults in the school, or how the teachers can learn better from one, one another. These are the factors that contribute to success, successful schools. And the researchers will study how more schools and districts can become learning organizations. And these are organizations that make good programmatic decisions. They hire and develop strong teachers. And they use and analyze data to tweak and improve their instructional programs. So because we are going to be asking our research and evaluations to answer more complex questions, it also means that we need to expand our repertoire of rigorous methods. So let me just say a few things about this methods, methods uh, that are uh, explicitly mentioned in my research priorities. So I think it's well known that IDS has done a fabulous job over its short history in increasing the scientific rigor of our work <laughs> by demanding stronger methods and a greater capacity to make causal inferences, and by training researchers across the nation in these rigorous standards. So while definitely not retreating from these rigorous methods, we do want to assure that it's our research and evaluation questions that drive our methods and not the other way around. Uh, I want to mention another project that will spark closer collaboration, and it's the work around the state longitudinal data systems. Uh, last spring, our National Center for Educational Statistics announced grant awards totaling $250 million to 20 states, including Virginia, for the design, <coughs> development, and implementation of these systems. Uh, these grants were funded through stimulus funds, and they're intended to promote linking of data across time and databases, from early childhood through K-12, post-secondary, uh, into career including the matching of students to teachers. Up until now, uh, states' focuses have been primarily on building these systems, not using the data to drive improvement at the policy level and at the school level. The other day, I had a visit from a state uh, higher education chief who had a longitudinal data system that they were very proud of and very pleased to have gotten a new infusion Money. And he told me about how the higher ed institute institutions could send back reports to high schools on, on the progress of those high schools graduates. And I thought, well, that's great, but why don't you really round out that agenda and maybe have reports that the high schools get for how their kids do college by college. So there are great opportunities here, but I think we need to, to broaden the uses and think how these can be really used to drive improvement in practice and policy. So we've got these uh, increasingly robust and rich data systems out there that a lot of users really don't know how to tap into. So we, we at IES want to figure out our best role in helping to encourage and develop partnerships with state and state, with districts and state data experts. 
And we could do this perhaps through training grants or regional labs. In order to support more timely, descriptive, and analytic feedback to schools. So educators in these systems have an abundance of questions that can be answered with descriptive longitudinal data. And they'll have even more of this with the expansion of these systems. Uh, and for those of you who apply for IES grants, please note that we do have a grant program specifically to encourage uh, research in the use of these uh, state longitudinal data systems. So I started off by saying how much I'd like to talk to uh, young researchers about their work. And I want to kind of conclude here with what I would uh, call a call to action to you influential folks and your colleagues nationwide. So you are the ones who are not the next generation of education researchers, are training the next generation of education research. And I want to ask you to really help us rethink the traditional model that's governed education <coughs> research for too long. Uh, we talk about and believe that we want our work to help schools. But we don't actually create the kind of incentives for young academics to pursue action-oriented research that can help schools improve. Uh, last spring, I attended a meeting in Washington that had uh, uh, researchers from across the country who were affiliated with organizations that had had a strong history of uh, partnering with school districts or state agencies. And these people had a uh, that was the biggest thing I had in common, but they were really quite different in many other ways, how they created their agenda, how they actually did the work. But there was a real common theme among them, which was the type of researchers that these organizations attracted and developed. And Catherine Snow, who's a researcher at Harvard, uh, was at that meeting from an organization called the Strategic Strategic Education Research Partnerships. And she was taking notes about this discussion and did just this fabulous uh, job summarizing what the commonalities of these researchers were. So I'm just going to end with that. Um, uh, she said that first, the researchers start with the needs of practice. Uh, second, they use their formidable technical skills more on the side of designing the studies than actually creating the research questions. They have a real deep understanding of the kind of complex interaction between what goes on in the classroom, what goes on at the school level, and what goes on at the district and state level, and how interdependent these are. They see that one of their uh, purposes and one of their goals is to help build capacity in schools and districts as a, a major goal of, of, of their work. Uh, and, and they use uh, sort of a com set of complex communication skills that enables them to really engage with practitioners and policy makers. And finally, uh, much of their work begins with really powerful descriptive data that, that helps to explicate current situations and current problems in a new way that enables policymakers and practitioners to build a theory of action around. So I want to do my small part at IDS to create some incentives for young researchers like this. Uh, we've rewritten language in our postdoc grants to make it clear that we're explicitly seeking trained scientists interested in engaging with practitioners and adding, asking more of the relevant questions that really matter to schools and lead to lasting, meaningful improvement in student outcomes. Uh, much education research, including a lot that's done at, at universities, uh, is driven more by the interests and theories of the researchers themselves and not the needs of problem and problems of practice. This has to change, and I'm uh, asking your help in changing. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I'll leave this time for questions.
is, is unusual. <laughs> so John, I, I have a question. Um, you, you touched on this um, in the end of your remarks about uh, a new way of training researchers and, and collaboration. And I'm wondering, um, given your experiences in Chicago, whether you could talk a little bit more about how researchers and practitioners and policymakers first got together and sort of um, worked out those relationships. Because I think it's that initial sort of connection that's often the most difficult, even if you have sort of willing partners on both sides. Right. Before I could answer that, so I you know, give this talk a lot, and I give it to the research community, and I encourage researchers to reach out to uh, policymakers and practitioners. Well, I also like to have the opportunity to be in front of policymakers and encourage them to re reach out to researchers because it clearly is a two-way two street. Uh, our work in Chicago got started sort of fortuitously. A guy named Tony Bright, who's a well-known researcher, is now president of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, uh, had just come to Chicago from Harvard, and he was he wanted so badly to work with school districts. And, and he just pounded on their door. He pounded and pounded and pounded. And finally, I think to get them off the, uh, their back, he asked, they asked for some help with a specific problem. Uh, they, we had uh, some good psychometric expertise. And the school district had always struggled with this. They called it the fourth grade slump. This is you know, 25 years ago, and we still hear about this. And uh, Tony got, got the data, got the item level, the item strings, and we're able to really do some nice psychometric analysis that uh, uh, helped understand whether this was a real fourth grade slump. So that was the beginning. Um, but then it was, we were also at a lucky time in, in history when the school system had this huge uh, um, reform that decentralized the school district, put a lot of autonomy at the local level, and it was an uh, issue of huge civic um, interest. And there was clear that there needed some really strong outside evaluation to help guide that. And that's what, what got us going. But it's not, you know, it's not easy. Um, uh, when I was executive director of Consortium, Arnie Duncan was head of schools, and Arnie was one of the most open he was open to bad news, it very kind of uh, unusual. So it takes a it takes that kind of uh, capacity at the top. Uh, but even when the top's not quite sure, there are people inside the organization who need guidance. And uh, yeah, I've been asked this question. Well, I, you know, I would really like to work uh, with a school district. Well, how do I do it? Uh, what should I do? And the advice we got from uh, I didn't give it, but a person in the room who has who has done this work was to you know take your expertise and go to kind of the, the middle management in the system who is responsible for that, whether it's human resources, whether it's curriculum, whether it's special education, and say you know I know I know a fair amount about this. Are there any kind of questions that you have that I could bring some data and some analysis and research to that? One of the um, ideas that you put forward that I really resonate here at UVA is um, the idea of what we're calling, and many others are calling, uh, translational research. Uh, but what you're suggesting is not just going from pure to apply, but then having very sophisticated, rigorous applied research put in terms that are communicable and understandable by various constituencies. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what techniques work. Um, you show you know, a short, well-written summaries of research uh, with an eye to how what practitioners can use. Uh, others would traditionally in Washington emphasize getting uh, op-eds out in the press. Others emphasize oral briefings of policymakers. What what are the best techniques for getting <coughs> the, uh, advanced applied research translated into usable terms for policymakers and educators? So I do, I, I do think that uh, I alluded to this. That idea of really powerful descriptive data can be so useful and so powerful. And you know, sometimes simple graphs, one page with a powerful graph can really, really open doors to this. And uh, you know, they're tricky, they're hard to do, how to get it right. Um, I, I've been lucky to have had a few of myself that just, you know, they just crystallize the problem in a way that people take 
very, very seriously. Uh, there's, also, there's also a lot of that being out there and talking to people all the time. Um, in Chicago, I spent half my time giving these talks. And uh, we, we sort of drew a fine line. We used to say, well, we're not going to talk about a study until it's done, until it's been reviewed, until it's been reviewed. totally, absolutely positive. But we started showing preliminary analyses to local groups quite, quite more often um, because we felt that it, it sort of engaged them early on. You know, it, it, it might take a couple of years for people to really get it and be able to figure out a response. So this, the, and that's why I sort of push for this partnership from starting at the beginning, engaging people, even in, even in the preliminary analysis. What does this mean? What does this tell us? Because it takes time to, um, to internalize this sort of stuff. Uh, so not starting at the end, starting further earlier in the cycle. Earlier you mentioned um, integrating the researchers with the practitioners to make a better research project. My sense, of course, is that teachers are really, really busy people. So what are the tricks of the trade so that these teachers can be engaged and still somehow do all the other stuff which they need to do? I mean, how, what, are the, what are the tricks of the trade to make this happen? So uh, maybe I had a lot of good luck on this, but uh, we would engage uh, groups that were already standing for another purpose, uh, either uh, either an advisory group at the teachers union. Um, Arnie had a group of 25 teachers every year that were kind of stellar teachers that had been um, nominated and were being recognized, and they met monthly so that we had an avenue with that. My colleague, Melissa Roderick, ran a network called Network for College Success that engaged uh, school leaders. So we, we would take advantage of already existing groups. And that seemed to be by far the best approach for us. But, although, if you needed ad hoc advisory groups, you, but it was usually through some other group that we could uh, help us engage folks. So, so they, they were already doing something like this. Okay. So related follow-up. If these are going to be practitioner researchers, what are the implications for ed school education? Meaning, that is, they go through their ed school program, to what extent should uh, yeah. research skills be part of their curriculum? So, I'm not really, rec I'm, that's not really what I'm saying. I, 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 was, uh, I was wondering what you're saying. <laughs> uh, uh, research is, you, you folks who have sat down with practitioners and policy makers, uh, you know, often there are issues, it, it takes a while to work it into a researchable kind of a question. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that we train all teachers to be researchers, or to, even to be uh, data users to the extent that it's often. I'm just suggesting that, that they have this really kind of input into the process, understand what we're doing, and understand why we're doing it to help them solve a problem. And I think there's a difference there. I'm sorry. So I, I love your example of the state higher ed uh, official that it came to your office. And I, I, I think, um, uh, well, the challenges of working within organizations are, are difficult. But the challenges of working across organizations, particularly between K-12 and higher education, are uh, potentially magnified. And I was wondering if you could speak to both from a funding perspective how to do a better job of bridging that gap. I mean, I think traditionally, if you look within the Department of Ed, the funding mechanisms are either higher ed funding or uh, K-12 and very rarely do they, they bridge that uh, 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 the set of really important questions that are at, at the transition. And then secondly, from your experience in Chicago, can you speak to how to bring those organizations together, the, uh, the K-12 organizations and the higher education organizations? It, 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 it's tough. Uh, well, I think the department has set some incentive structures around this. Certainly, the state longitudinal data systems do it. And I think there's clear interest in these transition points and the need for better articulation of alignment. And we're here out of the Common Core, we're here about through assessments. I think those are going to drive a lot of this. 
But my personal experience in Chicago was this was very, very difficult. Uh, in the higher ed, there were, you know, there were community colleges, there were state, you know, even the state, um, the university system and the college system uh, who were all independent. Uh, and so I, can, I, I don't have a good answer for you at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got, we, 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 got, uh, we got driven off of a college campus. We were, we got, uh, <laughs> because uh, my colleague Melissa Roderick did a study, a longitudinal study. She followed kids uh, through high school, through college, uh, through college graduation. And she had this beautiful descriptive graph that showed graduation rates by institutions in the Chicago area by uh, kids in human test scores. And the variability among these institutions for kids who look, look pretty similar uh, in terms of their incoming achievement level was just stunning. Uh, some of the, and, so, and some of these were the institutions that drew the most kids that would have you know, institutional graduation rates of 19 percent. Um, uh, and then kids with the same kind of qualifications would go other places where their graduation rates would be two or three times higher. Uh, and one of those schools would be let us on after we published. <laughs> California is interested in implementing some of our programs. They want to do it today. And we say, well, we have to wait till June to apply for our funding, which we'll get a year from then, and then your program will be over. So I, I don't know if you are thinking about that issue as you think about addressing these challenges. Well, we thought about it in very little ways. I kind of alluded to it in the, in the talk. We wanted to make uh, resources available to researchers who would uh, study some of the risks of the top uh, successful applicants. So we like tortured ourselves and contorted things to move up deadlines and, uh, to, so that if a state got uh, a risk of grant and the researcher had a successful grant application, they'd be on time. But it, it would, man, it was really tough. And then we didn't give any grants because nobody applied in winning states. So we, 
So do you imagine, just as a follow-up, so, so some, you know, NIMH and some of those folks have some just-in-time mechanisms for funding. Um, so I, I wonder if something like that would be really useful for these kinds of contexts. Yeah, that's, I, I appreciate that thought. Not, maybe to sort of piggyback on that, I wonder if you've thought about how to um, distribute the resources across the state so that the same state data systems don't get analyzed continuously. Um, although federal policy is the same across the country, the implementation of that policy differs and the nuances of every state can make a big difference on whether you can generalize across the states. Um, and I, I, I just wonder if you can comment on that. Well, North Carolina has this wonderful data system, and there's a lot of research about it, and, uh, uh, but it's North Carolina. I, I, I really want our labs to play a bigger role in helping states do that kind of, that kind of work so that we do have a, a broader uh, population of states who are able to do this. So that, so that is, that is uh, one of our specific goals. And are you thinking that the labs in the future will be permitted to do the just-in-time research that was just alluded to? Because it's a potential mechanism that already exists to support states and districts, and, and theoretically at least building relationships. Yes, it is. It is something we are thinking about. <clears throat> I, can, I you know, we're writing a statement of work that gets posted and all that sort of stuff. Comment and question. I, I train researchers here uh, at, at Curry, and uh, I, I found that the, the researchers that come through here who have had experience as teachers first and then become researchers have a really keen insight to that whole connection between research and practice that other students that I, that I often train don't quite, it takes them a little longer to get that research. Uh, my question is that, um, I, I'm not sure if you've seen this email that's uh, sort of been circulating by the comment by Diane Ravitch this week. And in this email, she talks about how there's been a recent study by uh, some economists about how a uh, three-year trial about uh, pay for performance. And the findings are that you know, pay for performance doesn't really work. Um, in this email, she points out at the end, she said the same day that these studies came out, the federal government announced some, some policies that sort of promote this pay for performance policy. And at the end of the email, her statement is, ideology always trumps research. And I'm wondering if you might respond to that <laughs> question. Well, the, the study is probably a study that came out of the, uh, Vanderbilt, the Center for Performance Incentives. Um, the, the department's response was that the study was very narrowly focused and that the department's policy was much broader, looking at better teacher evaluation, or many more uh, factors. Uh, uh, so, and I think that the people in the department took that study to heart. They really paid a lot of attention to it. Uh, but it was looking at a very, very narrow part of uh, what would be a teacher incentive program. The just-in-time point triggered a uh, strange thought uh, for me, uh, being a bit of a strange duck, uh, providing a little bit of background. I'm an Army intelligence guy with a doctorate in education and book out of school. And as such, what I hear, I really want to applaud the approach you're taking to, to making this link, because in my other business, Every commander, every decision maker at every level is joined at the hip with an intelligence officer whose job it is to answer his key questions. And as an education PhD, that stri strikes me as what our research job is, is to answer the decision maker questions, the policy maker questions, the principal's questions. Uh, that's how we get relevant. And so the joint just-in-time thought makes me wonder, are you looking at the possibility of perhaps especially postdoctoral funding 
to, act, to, to reverse the, the, the process and take people and maybe as clinical faculty at the university level, but whose position is joined at the hip to a decision maker, to a principal, to a superintendent, to a policy maker, uh, to answer their questions that require evidence-based educational research. Because in my other role as an elected leader in the educational technology end of our field, I hear the decision makers crying out for evidence-based research on which to base their key decisions. So perhaps, uh, are, are you, you know, uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts on feasibility and, and, and benefit uh, of perhaps funding some folks who are out there uh, to join with the decision makers, perhaps at the postdoctoral level, uh, who would then come back into the university as clinical faculty. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, we haven't done much, much like this. Uh, a couple of years ago, IES gave a grant to the Council of Great City Schools to pair uh, university researchers with superintendents. Uh, it was a more short time, a single question. It didn't have the kind of impact that, that you're suggesting. But it, I think well, we have to generate the interest yeah. first, so that could work. Yes, I have a comment and question about the IES for field initiated research. Uh, despite the rather broad range of topics that one can submit to, and as well as goals, um, it seems to me that uh, in order to develop more creative and innovative approaches, some of which you talked about, uh, it, it might be helpful if that field initiated option could, could be perhaps expanded somewhat or, or uh, Researchers could submit more than once a year. Are there, are, I wonder if you it agree that there are any there. chances that that's going we to be. We have something called unsolicited grant. Right. The, no, if it doesn't fit into the any of those. Yeah. But, but I'm just wondering if that might somehow be broadened or expanded, as well as, if I'm correct, that you can only apply once a year, or that that might, might be greater opportunities to, if you could submit twice. Or, I'll be happy to look into that. Um, in our work on teachers, I see two forces at odds, and I want to ask you about this. So on one hand, the district, it feels like the district is putting a lot of demand on teachers and principals for lots of use of lots of programs. You know, you take this program and you do this for a year, and then you take another program and you do that for a year. And then, on, so that's on one hand, there's this press for more and more use of new programs. On the other hand, from a perspective of a developmental psychologist, we know that change, human change takes time, and that if we're really going to you know, think about changing the views of teachers or changing the practices of teachers, that's a process that takes a couple years, you know, maybe a year, maybe two years, depending on the nature of those changes. And I'm wondering, what's your perspective on those two different forces and how they can um, speak to one another? Well, part of the you know problem is instability of leadership in districts and states, and, and teachers develop the "this too shall pass" attitude. And I think, <laughs> I think somehow we have we need greater stability. We need more long-term uh, efforts and more long-term planning. That, I think that's the only way it'll happen because because we see this turnover. You just, it just uh, almost always the new people throw out a lot of the old stuff and bring in new things that that. Uh, leads to cynicism among teachers that why invest heavily in this thing when it's probably going to be gone in two years? Uh, one of the things you mentioned is, um, is changing, changing a bit, but uh, talking about really broadening a bit the, the type of research that IES looks at. I think that there's a perception, and maybe you're alluding to this, that there's a perception that IES maybe swung too far into getting focused on, say, randomized controlled trials, but, but I think a, a byproduct of that is they've really introduced rigor. So how do you, um, what's the plan for, I guess, introducing more research methodology but still retaining some level of rigor, but without swinging back just for the wild west of the Well, uh, for one thing, I think that by focusing our attention on, on making sure
sure that the, the kind of questions that I'm talking about, the hows, whys, where's, for whom, is what, what are we really putting some of our methodological uh, uh, firepower onto those questions. And we're necessarily, you know, uh, building more rigorous methods to address those questions. We have a real strong, especially uh, not only through our research center, but through our evaluations, we have real strong technical expertise and the capacity to reach out broadly for assistance on that. So I think that's definitely the first place we're, we're going to go with this. Um, but, you know, I am really going to keep pushing on this uh, relevance and usability and uh, saying that we're going we're to maintain that rigor. But it's, it's going to be my focus, and it's got to be people like Re Rebecca Maynard who are going to be, they say, okay, John, we're going to figure out how we can do this, and we be sure that we're uh, doing it as best as possible. As we roll out these new grant programs with a, a stronger focus on relevance, can we talk a little bit about how you will determine what is relevant or, you know, a, 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 along the range, what's more relevant than something else? Well, that's a good question. I, um, well, I, I guess my the easy answer is, you know, is it uh, determined by this <coughs> partnership idea? And is it, is it really? Is it coming from people who have their feet on the ground? Mm -hmm. So he's looking perhaps for some evidence of the district's interest in the project. Exactly. As I think about um, thinking about what Sarah said about how schools districts, you know, especially when we talk about kindergarten programs and pre-K programs and how they're always dealing with transitions and programs and this new idea. And going back to what you said in your, um, in your talk about really listening to what the teachers have to say and what the school district looks like and really taking back time to observe um, and seeing what the strengths are and what the weaknesses are in that area instead of just you know, doing to them. And so would then mechanism for funding then be available to take that you know, year long time to really get to know the district and get to know the teachers and really be able to really ascertain what is best going to help improve the outcomes in, in that area? I, I, I get your point. I don't know how to answer that, though. It sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just, this, uh, both of you mentioned this idea of programs. Um, I often talk about, you know, how schools and districts look to programs to answer all their problems. And I mm -hmm. quote, uh, a guy named Charles Payne who wrote a book called So Much Reform, So Little Change. <laughs> uh, and it's about really dysfunctional urban schools uh, that buy programs all the time. They think they can make the difference when, you know, good programs don't add up to good schools. Uh, and it is understanding these organizational features of schools that enable them to be able to implement well, to actually change and tweak so I think understanding what are those processes to get these adults working better to do <coughs> uh, is really key to that, that issue. We do a lot of pre and post doctoral training here. And one of the things that it seems like this press for relevance, it would be really neat to build in to some of those training opportunities, ways that uh, student pre or postdoc trainees could write small grants to really immerse themselves with the challenging problems schools are facing. Have you thought about putting small grants, uh, creating small grants available to pre and postdoctoral trainees? Because they're all very eager to learn how to write grants as part of what they want to do, but they're not at a point where they can write these big expansive grants that are going to require two or three or four years to implement. Uh, at this point, we don't we don't have an ex explicit small grant program. There have been some times in the past where there have been, especially around secondary analysis and data analysis. Uh, but we are uh, in the RFAs actually have sort of lowered the kind of minimum, and will be encouraging small grant applications inside the inside the regular competition. But sometimes those don't have the same. You have to be to you have to be uh, you can't be a pre or postdoc to be a PI on one of those grants. Because of the university. Yeah. Right. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you, John. Thanks very much. So one piece of evidence of an engaging talk is the kind of conversation that follows it. And this has been a wonderful conversation about IGs that John has, has provided for us. So we're going to take a short break, but before you run off, I want to highlight the fact that in addition to what's in your program uh, about researchers that have actually actively engaged in the world of policy connected to practice and a set of policymakers who are here to talk with us about their experiences, there are a number of people in the audience from the world of policy and practice that I just want to highlight. Um, Jack Dale, who's the superintendent of the Fairfax County Public Schools, is here. Laura Fornash, the deputy secretary of education. From the governor's office, we have Eric Finkbeiner. Uh, Kathleen Shannon and Melissa Luchow, and Deborah Jonas, who's the director of research at VDOE. So there are a number of people here, and there's so the opportunity for us to engage in the kind of discussion that, that John has set up for us, I think, is, is really great. And so let's take a